Beep. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Washington Institute Policy Forum on the Kurds versus the Iranian regime. Inside Iran and regional implications. I'm Dr. Dave Pollack, the Bernstein Fellow here at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And I'm delighted to host this event and to welcome my two distinguished guests, both of Iranian Kurdish origin and both deeply involved in the politics and geopolitics of that people and the region. We have with us Mr. Abdullah Mohtadi, the leader of the Komala Party of Iranian Kurdistan, and Ms. Shukriya Bradost, a PhD candidate here in the United States and an expert on the geopolitics of the Middle East and on the Kurdish issue inside Iran. And I am going to uh, give them the floor in just a moment. But before I do, let me say just a word about how you can submit your questions to me and to our distinguished guests after our initial prepared remarks. The way to do that is if you're on Zoom, use the chat function at the bottom of your screen, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you are watching on live stream, on YouTube, or on our website, please email your questions to the following email address, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. That's policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to our first distinguished speaker, Mr. Abdullah Mohtadi. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, David, for organizing and moderating this timely uh, seminar, this timely meeting. It's about Iran, but from the Kurdish perspective, how the movement started. On the 17th of September, the movement started in Sakas, the hometown of Mahsa Urjina Amini, who previous day on the 16th was beaten to death by the notorious morality police in Tehran. At the funeral, people chanted slogans against the regime, and for the first time, collectively threw away their hijabs, their compulsory hijabs. The same day, the movement spread to Sanandaj, uh, historical and politically important city in the province of Kurdistan. Of course, Kurdistan is not just one province. Mm -hmm. There are four provinces. But anyway, that's another story. The day after, cooperation center of the Kurdish political parties, which is a coalition between Komala Party of Iranian Kurdistan and Democratic Party of Iranian Kurdistan, uh, formed in 2017, called for a general strike and a mass protest movement, which was fully observed by dozens of cities in the Kurdish areas. Soon it spread to Tehran University and then to Tehran itself and all, all around the country. So this movement was sparked by uh, Kurdistan. And then the main slogan of it, which defines the nature of the movement, Jin Jian Azadi, woman, life, freedom, it also originated from Kurdistan in its rich tradition of uh, women fighters against the Iranian regime. But this uh, Kurdistan also is and still is, was and still is the stronghold of this revolution. But uh, 
unfortunately, the revolution or the movement, whatever you call it, many people uh, prefer to call it in revolution in Iran. And there are reasons for that. This movement or this revolution, fortunately, is not confined to the boundaries of Kurdish areas. In fact, this is one of the main features of this revolution that is it has overcome ethnic boundaries, ethnic barriers, religious barriers, gender barriers, and even class barriers for the first time. So the solidarity among all Iranian people is unprecedented. And this is why we can call it, this is one of the reasons why we can call it uh, a revolution. In 2000, we have had in the past uh, huge protest movements, for example, the Green Movement in 2009. But that was confined mainly to Tehran and its educated middle, young middle class. Kurds and other ethnic groups were suspicious of the intentions of the leaders of the movement at that time and didn't uh, take part wholeheartedly. We also had 2019 movement a protest, a violent protest, not a violent protest, a protest that uh, then became violent because of the brutality of the, uh, the police force in 2019 uh, because of the sudden uh, fuel price hikes. But this time it's not about a certain demand it's about a fundamental change in the structure of the country. The Iranian regime tried to blame the Kurds for everything, for the unrest in Iran, and tried to persuade them, lure them into, a, into an armed conflict with the regime. But Kurds, and uh, especially the uh, cooperation center wisely showed restraint. We didn't engage in any uh, armed struggle because we wanted to give the civil peaceful movement a chance because this is the best way to bring about change in the country. For decades, Kurds have been portrayed by the Iranian regime as violent separatists. No more. Kurds, it took only a few days for the Kurds to be welcomed by Iranians, by people in Tehran, in Mashhad, in Isfahan, in Shiraz, as champions of freedom. People chanted, Kurdistan, Cheshmo, Cheraghi, Iran. Kurdistan is the eye and the light of Iran. So the solidarity is, is uh, fantastic. Uh, the question of leadership of this movement. As far as the Kurdistan, all four provinces and some adjacent areas are concerned, the, the leadership is there. Cooperation Center has provided a solid, good, lead, legitimate, and credible leadership in Kurdish areas. But that is not the case in all of Iran. But in all of Iran, we have uh, local leadership. We have a network of local activists, local leaders, field leaders, who are connected, closely connected via uh, social media and sometimes in person and coordinating slogans, coordinating actions, coordinating calls all over Iran. So the uh, 
the leadership on the ground is there. What is lacking is a leadership on a national scale in Iran. And that is something that we as Kurds are working on. It. Other peoples are also working on it. And this time I'm more hopeful than ever that we can achieve this. Uh, what we want the United States to do. First, clear unequivocal support for the movement. I hear some people say it is, it hurts the movement. Even if it was true at some point, this is no longer true. This is no longer the case. I give you just one example. When the American football team beat Iran national team, people came out to the streets and celebrated, celebrated their own national football team's defeat. This shows how deep the gap is between people and the regime and how, how fake is the story that the Iranian people hate America. This is not the case. The second thing is some people fear for the lives of activists mm. when America supports them. We are ready to bear the consequences. Please meet us. Please meet the Kurdish opposition as well as the Iranian democratic opposition. This encourages the Iranian people in the fight for democracy and human rights. This uh, will be a big boost of morale for the movement. And it also will be a message to the ranks, rank and file of the regime and the security forces and encourages desertion. The second thing is we are working, not just the Kurds, but I'm one of them. We are working on uh, forming a united Iranian coalition. Uh, I'm not calling it a leadership. I'm more uh, inclined to call it a delegation to convey the voice of this revolution and the voice of the Iranian people and in its different sections to the international community, to the United States and to Europe. Another message for the United States is, please do not give tens of billions of dollars to the butchers of people in Kurdistan, in Balochistan, and in Tehran, and other parts of Iran, on the pretext of reviving the JCPOA. Engage with the people of Iran. Listen to their voices and respect their revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abdallah Mohtadi, leader of the Komala Party of Iranian Kurdistan. And now I want to turn the floor over to you, Shukriya Brados, and the floor is yours thank for about you. 10 minutes. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for having us. And thank you for Washington Institute organizing this timely uh, panel. Um, allow me to start my uh, statement with, talking, with telling you a story of a young girl in 2003 in Iranian Kurdistan. In 2003, a young girl at age 17 with her friends, they established a committee named Woman and Life. Mm. And they work on the Kurdish cause in Iran. And this year, girl now is front of you and talking about this revolution. <laughs> okay. That's the reason that for me is heartwarming. I can see after more than a decade, the same slogan that forced me to leave my country and live in exile first, I, I, I escaped the Islamic regime to Iraqi Kurdistan and I lived there. And even there, they didn't leave me alone. So they forced me even to leave the Kurdistan region of Iraq. So mm. here I found myself in the US and still the same power, same girl. 
after years working and standing against the Islamic regime. Why is important? Because that committee, that work we did in that age, young age, it, we weren't alone. That revolution of the Kurdish woman started year before what I did and my friends. And this, this goes back even in 1946, when the first time Kurdish, Kurds have a Kurdistan Republic in Mahabad, they established the Kur, first Kurdish government that those days. And we had a Kurdish woman union and women joined the institution, political, social, and work life. We shows you when we're talking about the woman revolution in Iran or even Kurdish woman revolution in Iran, we're talking about the society that Kurdish women, because of the cultural, social cultural uh, environment, they had the less conservative environment in Iran because they've been engaged in agricultural life because of economy that they, they, they engage with the Kurdish society. That's the reason we have a less conservative society. And that allowed us as a Kurdish woman to, to have a more active role in the revolution. And, and the, the, the woman right being part of the other, other part of our revolution that's the reason when before we opening this panel, I was telling you always um, introduce me as a woman. She knows about the geopolitical security. I remember even during my master program, uh, I had a professor. She was asking me uh, why you don't take class for the international human right. I told her, you know, I'm a Kurd. I learned through my life experience that if I want to protect my, my, my people, I have to learn about the strategy geopolitics, security. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason I start studying that subject. And, and going back to, to our panel today, which related to what I said about it, Iranian people doing asking for a revolution against a regime which call itself a revolutionary regime, mm -hmm. which is really important to consider that concept. What is revolutionary regimes mean? which means we don't talk about the normal state that have a normal foreign policy or domestic policy. We're talking about the regime that still think itself as a, as a revolutionary that want to change the world, change the Middle East countries, change the, the status quo that we have in the, in the global stage. So that's the reason they even they call the regime supporter as a revolutionary people. Uh, you have a Rahbar Enqalabi, revolutionary supreme leader, so that's interesting when you when we're talking about the revolutionary movement right now, Iranians standing against this regime, because this regime never considered Iranians people as a people who deserve to 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 use the wealth of this country for the better life, mm -hmm. to have their own voice in the international stage. What we hear from this government or this regime is a clerk or the, the people who are trying to tell the world. You know, this is our culture, this is our people, they want to change the world, they want to change the, the, the opinion of the, the Islamic people in the region. But the, 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 the revolutionary movement in Iran, it shows us the, not just Middle East, I think it's the first in the history of the humanity. We're seeing a woman leading a revolution against a, um, a, a radical Islamic ideology. Hmm. which is important, which is the reason we call it the renaissance of the history of the Middle East. That's the reason, I'm, I'm sure I don't want to talk more than 10 minutes, let's go back to the second round about how this have an impact on the regional country and why we don't see that much support from other countries like rival, Iranian rival, like hmm. Turkey, Saudi, or even Israel hmm. in supporting of that revolution, which I will talk in the second round. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You've given us, both of you, a lot to think about, and um, I'm expecting a lot of good questions from our large audience today. Before I open up the floor to those questions, I want to make a few remarks myself about something that I have studied most closely, which is not so much the situation inside Iran, but how it affects neighboring countries, how it affects Kurds in particular in neighboring countries, and what the Iranian regime is doing, not only against its own people inside Iran, but even across its borders, attacking in particular violently almost every day for the last three months, targets across the border of Iran, inside Iraqi Kurdistan, 
targeting, so they say, Iranian opposition groups based in that region, but in fact, killing and injuring civilians and local people, Iraqi Kurds, without discriminating among the targets of these Iranian missile and drone and artillery attacks. Why is it that the Iranian regime faced with internal unrest, not just in Kurdish areas, but all across the country, why is it that it is focusing so much attention and energy and actually violating its own principles by attacking a neighboring country and attacking civilians inside that country. There are a couple of different theories about that. And I want to say that in my own considered opinion, neither of the two major theories is exactly right. There's one theory that Tehran is doing this in order simply to distract attention from the internal unrest inside its own country and blame it on foreign agents, especially on what they call foreign Kurdish separatists or terrorists in the language of the Iranian regime. I don't think that the Iranian regime actually believes its own propaganda about that because I think they know that the Kurds inside Iraq, although sympathizing with their cousins in Iran and the Kurdish political opposition parties inside Iraq are not actually engaged in reality in smuggling or arms deliveries or military action or any of the the other forms of intervention inside Iran that the regime accuses them of. There is no evidence of that so far, at least of which I am aware. <clears throat> so that theory that the Iranian regime is doing this simply in order to distract attention or because they believe that there's a real threat to their own stability, the stability of the regime inside Iran seems very unconvincing. The revolution or the movement against the regime in Iran is not just a Kurdish thing, and it's not supported mostly from the outside. It's internal across the country. But I do think that the Iranian regime is worried enough about its own internal stability that it is trying more than just to distract and to deflect and to scapegoat and to blame. It is trying to prevent what it sees as a possible future coalition of internal and outside opponents of this regime. In much the same way, I have to recall that the Islamic regime in Tehran came to power in the first place more than 40 years ago. They're worried about it. And the fact that they are attacking across the border is a sign of how seriously worried the Iranian regime in Tehran is by this internal unrest. Now, I want to turn briefly to some evidence of how much the Iranian regime, and in particular the Supreme Leader, is intent on this campaign against the Kurds, not just inside Iran, but even in Iraq across the border. On November 29th, Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme Leader, met with the new Prime Minister of Iraq, Mohammad Shia as Sudani. And Khamenei, responding to Sudani's claim that Iraq would not allow threats to Iran from Iraqi soil. Khamenei said as follows, according to the official transcript released by the Iranian government. Sadly, I'm quoting Khamenei, sadly, this is now happening. In other words, threats 
to Iran's regime stability. Sadly, this is now happening in some parts of Iraq, obviously referring to Iraqi Kurdistan. And the only solution is for Iraq's central government to extend its authority to those areas. Meaning that while ignoring the fact in public at least that Iran itself is attacking those areas week in and week out, Khamenei is demanding from the new Iraqi government that it provide security for Iran along its borders with Iraqi Kurdistan in the face of an imaginary threat from Kurdish political groups or Kurdish people inside Iraq. And Khamenei's threat was amplified in the regime mouthpiece, the newspaper Kaihan, the same day. And here again, I'm quoting. And you won't believe the violence, the virulence of this language used by this semi-official Iranian newspaper. This is the quote, hence this visit is an effective measure, the visit of the Iraqi prime minister to Tehran a few uh, days ago. This visit is an effective measure, Kaihan says, in exterminating the separatist groups that lurk in Iraq. After this visit, we can expect the Iraqi government, along with Iran, to take more serious measures than ever before to disarm and chastise these cunning and opportunistic groups. Putting down these barbaric armed groups is another severe blow to America and the Zionist regime. This is Kaihan, the mouthpiece of the Iranian regime. And Mr. Mohtadi's political party of Iranian Kurdish opposition and others like it based inside Iraq across the border are the direct targets of this campaign of what the Iranian regime itself calls extermination. So what is the response to all of this? And in particular to the Iranian regime's attacks against Iraq. I'll be very brief here. The Baghdad government is inclined, I'm sorry to say, to cooperate to some extent at least with the Iranian regime. And certainly not to protect Iraqi Kurdistan against these Iranian attacks. And that reflects a balancing act, to be fair, that the Baghdad government feels it needs to maintain between Iran's great influence inside Iraq and Iraq's desire to remain as much as possible, at least, an independent sovereign country, but heavily under Iranian influence. The government of Iraqi Kurdistan, the KRG, Kurdistan Regional Government, based in Erbil, is caught in between its sympathy for fellow Kurds, its desire, likewise, to remain free of complete domination by Iran and its agents on the one hand. And on the other hand, its weakness, its internal divisions, its lack of capacity to defend its own territory against these violent Iranian attacks. And its preoccupation with today, with economic crises, with internal political feuds between the two major parties that control Iraqi Kurdistan, the KDP, Kurdish Democratic Party, and the PUK, the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, and its continuing dependence on Baghdad for revenue and for external security. And so 
again, my own analysis suggests that it would be very difficult, even for the government of Iraqi Kurdistan to actively protect even itself and the people on its own soil of Iranian Kurdish origin from these Iranian attacks. That leaves the United States as perhaps the only party that could provide some protection to Iraq, to Iraqi Kurdistan, and to innocent civilians in Iraqi Kurdistan in the face of these Iranian assaults across the border. And I would say that so far, I have yet to see, although I may not know some things that are going on perhaps behind the scenes, I have yet to see a serious American offer to do exactly that either to the Iraqi government in Baghdad or to the Kurdistan regional government of Iraq in Erbil. I'm not sure that even if the United States made a serious offer to increase the defensive capability of those governments, those two governments against Iran, that they would accept an American offer of more support because they worry understandably, if that would be sufficient to protect themselves against a much stronger Iranian military force. But at least in my personal opinion, the offer should be made. And it should be coordinated between Erbil and Baghdad, not offered simply to one or the other, because in order to be effective, this would have to be done together in some kind of trilateral understanding between the United States, Kurdistan regional government, and the Iraqi government in Baghdad. And I hope in the future, in the near future, that in order to fulfill its rhetorical commitment to support the Iranian opposition and to protect our friends in Iraq and particularly in Iraqi Kurdistan, that the American government will move in that direction. So with that, I am going to conclude my remarks and I'm going to turn to all of the questions and answers that uh, appear on my screen. And um, let's see what we have. We have a question first from Michael Morgan. And uh, it is as follows. With the expressed national leadership vacuum right now, and what the speaker has also expressed, that there are other organizations or factions all working to fill this national leadership vacuum, why should we not expect a similar outcome that we've seen in Iraq, Libya, or other places in the region? In other words, multiple warring sects or factions or militias or opposition groups fighting for control rather than a unified opposition to the regime in Tehran. Can I turn that question over to you too? Uh, Iran is different from Libya and Syria in, in many ways its history, its society is different. Uh, we have a, even under severe dictatorship, we have developed a civil society. And we have a solidarity that is not seen, that was not seen in Syria or in L Libya or in probably mm -hmm. other countries. Mm -hmm. In Iran now, in this movement, it's Shiite and Sunnis together. It's Kurds and Persians together. It's Baluchis and Azaris together. So we have, we have oh, as I mentioned before, we have 
overcome the ethnic barriers. We have come the overcome the gender, the class barriers, the uh, language barriers, the religion barriers so uh, i'm more optimistic and i think there is no sign that uh, we are going to have internal conflicts mm -hmm. i cannot deny it theoretically mm -hmm. but there are no signs that we are going towards uh, an internal conflict mm -hmm. quite the opposite is correct we are going to converge together the movements are converging, the oppositions are converging, are uh, going together. So I'm more optimistic in Iran than mm -hmm. other countries. Thank you. Shukriya, yeah, would you actually, like to? Yeah, I want to answer the question. Before sure. I'm going to that question, I want to have a, adding some comment on your sure. mark. Uh, regarding the US, how they can help Kurds uh, in Iraq, uh, let's uh, remember there is an agreement between US and Iraq when they withdraw from Iraq, okay. the agreement is still working, and U.S. Uh, alleged to the promise to going to protect Iraq from the terrorist attacks. Okay. So how is going to work in this case? Because we know RGC in the terrorist list for the for the America. So let's remember there is agreement, and that, if that, that's a very good point. <laughs> yeah. So if if they want to attack the attack being in the the Komala's party. President Democratic of Iran's party and other parties in they located in the Iraqi Kurdistan okay. being attacked by RGC, right. terrorist group. And it's their US responsibility to the agreement that they promised that they met yes. in Iraq to do and they protect Iraqi Kurdistan and Iraq from uh, that attacks. And we know now they're trying to to use the uh, land forces, not just the air forces. They're threatening. They're yeah, threatening. they're threatening. And I, I you know, um, I'm working on the uh, on a paper. I'm trying to say why Kurds are the easiest target mm -hmm. with the Iranian. Um, um, in my paper, I'm explaining uh, to, Iran had a three target to divert what's going on inside the country. It's Saudi Arabia, yeah, and Azerbaijan in north, right, and Kurds. Each case, when we, we evaluate what's going on, Kurds are the easiest one. Why? Because for the Saudi Arabia, if Iran want to attack Saudi, and we know Saudi send intelligence, yes. share intelligence information with the White House right. that Iran is going to attack as imminent attack. Right. What happened? White House came with a really strong right. response, and right. they say we're going to respond if any attack happened. Right. Why? Because there is an energy crisis we have in the world, and it's not 2019 with the Houthis attacking the Saudi and U.S. saying just the simple condemnation. Now, uh, the, the Arab country is more united, too. We know the relation between Qatar and Saudi and other country much better. And another part, which is a really deep argument with the Houthi situation after six months of the six months of the peace agreement, even these these ceasefires ended, we didn't right. see any attack from Houthis and Saudi right. Arabia. Right. Which have another reason because Iran cannot support them and Houthis care about their own interests too, which Iran started supporting these Houthis in 2011. That's why Saudi is not the target now. Right. Uh, let's go for the Republic of Azerbaijan in the north. The, the, for me, it's really wondering me when I've been here for years, I've been uh, doing research in this north border between Azerbaijan and Iran. Now they are in really high, te high tension between yes. these two countries. Yes. They're attacking each other on the media, in the media, diplomatically and uh, militarily. Right. There, were, there was a um, uh, military drill in Iran and uh, Azerbaijan border in October. Right. And just a few days ago, it was uh, uh, the Azerbaijan and Turkey's military right. drill in the, uh, the Iran border. Right. And Azerbaijan, Aliyev publicly, he's attacking Iran's land and call it the soft Azerbaijan. And, uh, is, and if Iran wanted to attack any enemy right now, they should be Azerbaijan because it's publicly asking Iran, you know, it's a part of the land that's going to be uh, attacked. But why they don't attack Azerbaijan? Mm -hmm. I think because uh, this uh, Azerbaijan victory in the second Negro Karabakh war uh -huh. and uh, Azerbaijan's got support from Israel and Turkey yes. tells Iran, if you attack Azerbaijan, you will put yourself in the same situation that Putin put himself, attacking Ukraine. 
mm-hmm. because they have uh, I, exactly. I come not exactly but in the in the in the case of okay. how it would have uh, support right. and Iran or, already uh, isolated itself it doesn't have anyone not China not Russia with this situation going to help Iran right so they increase the tension okay. but it's not going to happen any attack anytime soon right so who are the easiest one right Kurds. I I absolutely agree with what you just said I was going to say that myself it's in my notes uh, but I ran out of time and I think that this is a very important point that you're making easy targets it's not just that the Kurds are an easy target it's that nobody no other country has come out strongly in support of their defense against Iran yeah, that's the point and the and has made a commitment to retaliate against Iran or to protect its friends against Iran if Iran attacks them the way as you said that Turkey is doing for Azerbaijan and that the United States recently did for Saudi Arabia recently yeah that, 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 that's Arabia. that's actually important argument and that I I think reinforces my point that if the United States did come out strongly in favor of protecting and actually did something to show that it was committed to protecting Iraqi Kurdistan against Iranian threats I think Iran would back off I think they would be afraid that's the challenge exactly the point. that yeah especially given all of the internal unrest in Iran right now. That's exactly uh, the point and and I have I have another point to sure. to make um uh, for the for the uh, you talk about the Sudanese uh, the the prime minister Iraqi prime minister visiting Tehran. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's the one Iran tried the best to bring him into power, which he's in power with a temporary. We know that. It's not a stable power for the Iran backed Shia groups. Right. Why? Because the revol- revolutionary movement in Iran is is already started in a different country in the region. Uh-huh. Iraq is one of them. Right. Why? Because there is a change in the Middle East people's pop- among the population. Young populations looking for different life. It's not just Iranian. It's Iraqi too. What we saw in Iraq in 2019 with the Tashrini's protests yes. asking Iran right. to like don't engage involve on, in our uh, right. internal right. affair right. Right. you have to you know just leave our country alone right. and these uh, politicians in Iraq they know that very well and that's the reason during the last election in Iraq you didn't see this Iran back Shia militia Shia group like Maliki he right. didn't use the uh, Shia uh, like a Shia speech or Shia uh, s- s- statement in his uh, campaign for election. What he used they was lost. They yeah, lost. what yeah. they used it was a nationalism. Right. So the wave of the nationalism in the Middle East is increasing, yeah. and that's make Iran's less influencer in the that countries. Right. That's one of the reasons. And second reason, I'm um, agree with the, Mr. Mohtadi about the GCPOA and sending that all money to uh-huh. to to Islamic regime. One of the reasons we see Hezbollah agree to sign the agreement uh-huh. with the indirect agreement with Israel and the, and the maritime in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean Sea right. Uh, right. Uh, about the gas that gas resources is because they don't get money. Yeah, right. As as Nas- Hassan Nasrullah said, as long as Iran has money, we have money. <laughs> so as long as Iran doesn't have a money, we don't have a money yeah. here. All right. I don't want to get too far afield from, but I think you're right. Yeah. I think that's important. Um, so let me turn to some more questions that are a lot more questions that are showing up. Uh, we have a question from Patrick Clawson, and um, it goes like this: What progress can you hope to achieve while the Islamic Republic remains in power? Is regime change a prerequisite for any progress? I'm advised by some people in Washington that not to use the term regime change because it's, <laughs> it's, okay. it's toxic here. Okay, fair enough. But fair enough. that's what Iranian people want. <laughs> that's not my fault. Okay, okay. I do not see any, the prospect of any real tangible change 
for the better in Iran while this regime is in power. Okay. Okay. A brief answer. Okay, good. Thank you. Shukriya. Uh, when I define the Islamic regime as a revolutionary regime, yes. that tells what is revolutionary regime looking for uh -huh. outside and inside the country. And if you change even one of the these main uh, goal of this regime, it will collapse already. So that's the reason, like in this compensatory hijab is one of these uh, uh, backbone of the regime's uh, rule. So if they 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 give up on that law, that rule is mean is already collapsing inside the 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 structure. That's the reason I don't believe they're going to um, to to confess or to accept any kind of the demand that people asking for change. And when we say why the regime suppressing people inside and killing people outside mm -hmm. of the country. Mm -hmm. That's why the concept of the revolution regime is trying to do. Iran, as a, as the regime, cannot act like a normal government. Okay. So what they do, they trying to have a, one security issue inside of the country, mm -hmm. one outside the country. Inside the country, for years, they tried to securitize Kurdish identity, Baluch identity, and these regions to always, whenever people asking for, for the normal human right, right, they say, oh, if you talk, the, the country will be separate. You're a separatist. The, the, right. You're separatist. Right. And for the Tehran and other cities, they will tell you, oh, you're agent of the Israel and yeah. America. Right. And when the outside, they're trying to find another enemy in the region. Okay. They re sorry, they, may I? Uh, sure, please. They really believe or pretend, at least uh -huh. pretend to believe that they are appointed by God himself. Mm -hmm. yes. And... Uh, yeah, but there's a pragmatic side uh, yes, sometimes to the regime, isn't there? Are there are two elements, okay. misogyny and anti-Americanism. That are, that are so deep that they can't change. They them. can't change. Okay. And okay. this, these are the sources of many, many uh, deficiencies in Iran. Okay. Good. Um, thank you for that. Um, I want to move on to another question from this is from Jiar Rashid. Uh, this is interesting because it's a different angle. What will be the next steps to see as peaceful of a change in Iran as possible? How do you see the political transitions materializing? And what prospects are there for minority communities like Kurds and Baluk? within Iran. Can, in other words, can this revolution succeed in a peaceful way or not? And then what happens afterwards to Kurdish or Baluk or other minority rights in the country? Um, uh, actually, I can say for the first time, Iranian are united. Okay. And, and the number of the people who are united is larger than the government because who's supporting this government is because of their own interests okay. they found in this government. When we say you don't have to remove the sanction on Iranian right now and you have to put IRGs in the, the terrorist the list right now, not for US, for the Canada and the Europe countries. Why? Because IRGC controlling all the sectors in this country, economy, everything you, you can consider for the human, normal individual uh, seeking in Iran. So why is important when, when, you, when they don't have a money and they don't have a disinterest in the government, they will leave the, this regime alone. That would be easiest way to how they can change the regime inside the country when they don't have that much IRGC nice. support inside the country. So when I say we have a more united right now, that's make me to believe that we would not have that kind of the a civil war inside the okay. country okay. and it will make it easy transferring of the power but it depends how long these um, um, military forces and energy forces going to support the regime okay. and it's all depends on how much they're going to gain from the supporting that regime okay. if they don't give they don't gain what they're looking for mm -hmm. they're going to leave but and there is a report actually came out it shows they're trying to find some some countries to invest to to uh -huh. to to, right. to to take their money to yes. it's interesting the the Venezuela one of the countries that report came out they're trying to send the money to the Venezuela. I was expecting they sent to the Russia or China, but right. it came up Venezuela one of the interesting I, destination. I saw, I saw that report. I, you know there there are a lot of reports coming out and from all sides and 
we have to be very careful I definitely think, uh, definitely to evaluate the credibility of all these there's definitely. a lot of fake news from, but from all sides trust me before before yeah. even this revolution started yes we know the iran's regimes people they already take the money outside uh -huh. of the country so it's nothing new even if they report the fake or uh, okay. true okay. we know the kids the family living the luxury in life in dubai, yeah in right. dubai yeah. in canada they <laughs> okay. have a, one of the one of the best example actually yes. the drones that iran sold to russia yes in ukraine when they found the material being used in this drone, where where this material being shipped to the Iran from Canada, yeah, I know. from the Germany, how from the these fake or the IGC related uh -huh. companies under different names. So that shows us they have a lot of money in, outside of the Iran under different names and different companies' names that how related okay. to the IRGC we will see All in right. the future with All the right. documented. Yeah, maybe, maybe so, but it doesn't show that they're prepared to defect to other countries if if the regime becomes weak or poor, you know, you, you see what I mean? They do have a presence in many other countries through all kinds of front companies and uh, and so on, and double agents and whatnot. And people are being arrested all the time for violating sanctions and for smuggling. But one of the reason Russia, Russia and uh, after all the European put a sanction on the Russia. Yes. Iranian official statement was, we can help Russia yes, yes, how yes. to pass this sanction because Absolutely. we are well experienced now. Right. That, that tells us the story behind that all right. this money was. That, that's right. They're, they're, they're in it together. Um, yes. Abdullah, would you like to comment on the question of whether the revolution can succeed in a peaceful way? We're not injecting violence into the, this movement. We want to avoid uh, violence, and we have restraint from retaliation. Uh -huh. Yeah, but we cannot guarantee because it's it's the regime that decides whether uh, to concede peacefully to people's demands. Right. So I cannot guarantee it will remain pe more or less peaceful. It's okay. not peaceful. It's violent, but it. The massacres have only taken place in Baluchistan, yes. in Zahidan, yes. and to some extent in Kurdistan. Yes. We have about uh, 500 people killed, mm -hmm. thousands wounded, mm -hmm. more than 18,000 people Ar arrested. arrested. Yeah. So it's not, uh, we cannot call it uh, a peaceful movement, but it can be more violent. Mm -hmm. uh, whether, but they have, they have problems. It's not easy for them. They there are signs that for the regime for the mm -hmm. regime yeah. that there are signs among them that shows they have some doubts about how cruel and uh -huh. brutal they should act uh -huh. against their own people because uh -huh. sons and daughters of many officials take part in the protests as uh -huh. well. Uh -huh. And there is there is confusion among them how, about how best they can control the movement. So there are confusions, there are tensions among them, there are doubts among them. Uh, it's not it's hard to tell whether it will turn into a completely violent one or not. Okay, uh, David, I want to yeah. add something about the wildlife. Sure. Uh, we pass eighty days of yes. this protest, of yes. this revolution. Yes. The regime try its best to turn this peaceful protest to the violation of sure. the civil war. Right. What they did, they used the, 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 the war weapon, military weapon tanks uh, to attack in the civilians in the Kurdish region mostly, but it didn't turn to the, the civil war. I think the regime trying to do that trying to one of the one of the my argument i met when they they attack in kurdish region and and killed 106 yes. people directly with the military weapon yeah among 122 people being killed in kurdish region what they did the plan was that the plan was if we kill the kurds the civilian who are just empty hand protesting mm -hmm. in the street we will force in the Iranian Kurdish party right. to engage. Yeah. And if they don't engage, the Iranian Kurds who are living in Kurdistan, they will criticize the political party like Komala, KDPI. So you're our political party, 
and the most organized and the only uh, the, the group that they have a weapon and the guerrillas, why are you not protecting mm-hmm. us? Which we hear that yeah. ways actually. Yeah. So in this case, what will happen? The Kurdish party will engage yeah. and they will come to protect. And when they engage, now we have a war that we right. want to yeah. unite the rest of the country right. in the, the behind Kurds. of the Islamic regime and stand against that. Yeah. So they try it, but after 80 years, this Atemba regime haven't days. been successful. Yeah. Right, yeah, yet. okay. We showed everybody showed restraint, yeah. except yeah. the regime. Right. All right. Thank you. Um, I have two questions on my screen and only a few minutes. So, with your permission, I'm going to take these two together. They're related, uh, I think. Um, one is about how can we overcome the US concept of one Iraq? This is from Paul Davis to help the Kurdish region. Baghdad is very close to Iran, but we can only get help to Erbil through Baghdad. Can we get help to the region without reversing that policy? Well, I guess maybe that's a question to me, uh, since I'm the one who (laughs) talked about Iraqi Kurdistan um, the most. And my short answer is I'm trying to be realistic. um, And I don't think there's any prospect of reversing the United States policy of one Iraq and of insisting that uh, any support that we give to the Kurdistan regional government has to be coordinated with Baghdad. But what I do think is that there is some prospect of finding a way to, as I said in my remarks earlier, to work together with Erbil, with the Kurdistan regional government and Baghdad, the Iraqi federal government, in order to channel more American defensive, I emphasize defensive support to Iraq, to resist these Iranian pressures and attacks on Iraqi soil and The example that (laughs) that, uh, the analogy that came to my mind is the United States is right now, as we speak, it's not not directly connected to Iran. I wanna make that clear, but it is a Kurdish issue far away to the West in Syria. The United States right now is putting significant diplomatic and even physical like troop presence uh, american troops pressure on the government of turkey our own ally in nato not to attack anymore the kurds in syria and if we are willing to do that uh on that front where, again, the Kurdistan regional government is getting it from both sides now, from Iran and from Turkey, east and west. Uh, If we are willing to restrain Turkey in its campaign against the Kurds, then it seems to me we should certainly be willing, more willing even, to restrain Iran in its campaign against the Kurds. But the issue here is, as I said before, not so much or not only will the US be willing to do this, but will Baghdad and Erbil be willing to accept American support because they don't trust us that much anymore. I understand that. And they know that they're you weak. leave at any moment. And they, they know that, and I understand that. And that's all the more reason in my own view for us to be very, very firm about this. The way we recently have become more firm about defending Saudi Arabia and other countries, other friends of ours in the region against Iran or other threats. So that's one question, and I hope I've I've tried to answer it. And now the last question is the US supports the, this is from Shiman Zibari. The US supports the Iranian people's struggle for human rights, democracy, and freedom. So how can they help if the regime remains? In other words, I guess what this questioner is asking, uh, it's 
almost uh, uh, an echo of a previous question. Is there any hope for any change, positive change in Iran that the United States can promote without going all the way toward what you said you don't want to say in those words, regime change. Let's call it a revolution, all right? Is there, is there something that the United States can do that would be useful and constructive and in, in line with our values and our interests uh, that might fall short of a complete a confrontation with the Iranian regime. We are not seeking confrontation by the United States with the Iranian regime. Okay. We are not seeking American boots on the ground, okay. the tanks or uh, airplanes or anything. Right. Okay. What we what we ask is political support for the okay. movement. Okay. And answering that question, I would say all the hopes and efforts to all the hopes and efforts to make the Iranian regime change its behavior have till now been futile yes. mm -hmm. you cannot do the same and expect okay. a different result <laughs> okay my answer would be just don't help regime just don't help the regime. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Why? Because uh -huh. I, I suggest the policymaker in the DC just do your research and see how the Islamic regime is the reason, one of the reason the US wasn't successful in Iraq. Sure. Wasn't successful in the in the Afghanistan even. Uh -huh. And okay. even why now Saudi Arabia getting closer to China. Yeah, sure. So all tells you, for example, that Saudi Arabia. Because so, uh, U.S. didn't have a, that much support for Saudi against Iran. That was one of the reasons they don't want to like deal with the U.S. demands right now with energy demands. So that shows you you don't know how to play your cause as a U.S. when you're region, and you already left the region, and you're now trying to go back. If you want to go back, now we can see the policymaker trying to say, to say, okay, we cannot leave that power vacuum in the region. We have to go back after we left with this. Skin in with the scene in the Afghanistan's uh, air, um, airport. If you want to go back, you have to deal with the enemy first. You have to change. I, I use that word change of the regime is the only solution for Iranian and for Americans if they want to have a better policy in the region without any of these militia groups mm -hmm. or with this country's problem. The country in the region, like Qatar, Saudi, other country, you can see their policy, the foreign policy is focusing on how they can develop the economy. And they feel this change among uh, the, the change that I explained about how the society is being changed in the Middle East, mostly young people. This country trying to have a little bit of flexibility in, inside the country because they yeah. feel that wave is coming. So they don't want to be like Islamic regime. So that's the reason you can make deal easier with them the way you will deal with the Islamic regime that always calls you as an enemy. So the only way to do it is a Focusing on how we cannot help them to stay in the power and release the money, like what it happened in 2015. All this money went to the pocket of the militia groups. Okay. And we have a created new Zainab Yun, Fatimi Yun, even in after that, of the money reaching to the Islamic regime. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I, am, I am impressed by the confidence that you have in the Iranian people. At the same time, I am not as confident myself that this movement as worthy as it is, will be able to succeed in the face of the violent resistance that the regime will be willing, I think, to um, um, use against ordinary Iranians, whether Kurds or others, if these protests go on. Uh, and I would like to think, and I think there is a chance 
that it can succeed. I'm just not um, certain that it will. And therefore, we all have to start to think about what happens next if the regime overcomes this crisis, and it's a real crisis for them, I think, uh, or if the protests go on and on and degenerate into violent confrontations, as we saw in some other countries in the region that go on for years without a uh, definitive outcome. I, I certainly hope that that's not okay. what There's we see. There's always hope but, for change. Right. But I want to just thank you for a very thoughtful and interesting presentation and uh, very candid, I think, answers to very pointed questions from our excellent audience today. We've gone over time, and so I'm going to have to call this forum to a close. But again, I want to thank our guests, Abdallah Mohtadi, the leader of the Komala Kurdistan, Iranian Kurdistan political party, and Shukriya Bradost, a geopolitical analyst and PhD candidate of Iranian Kurdish origin here in the United States for joining us in person today. Delighted to have you here in person. I understand you had the opportunity Mr. Mahtadi to meet with some members of Congress on this trip and convey the message that you conveyed to us today as well in a more private setting, uh, less influential, but more private. And uh, I wanna thank our audience for your attention and close this session. On behalf of the Washington Institute, I'm Dave Pollack. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave Pollock, and thank you, the Washington Institute. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.